Hey, what's going on, y'all? It's Skeptic Autopsy back at you again with another video. And pretty much, uh, I had this video idea uh, for a while since, you know, I've seen the movie like somewhere in January before, you know, I came back to uh, Pennsylvania. And, you know, as I promised, or, you know, uh, with a few inceptions of some things I didn't promise on, but that's besides the point, I pretty much promised I was going to do a review on this uh, movie as soon as, you know, I was able to, like, settle down and all that, and when everything kind of, like, ceased for a while that's going on in my, uh, you know, my, my, my life. <laughs> so, you know, I finally put some time aside for it, so, yeah, here it is. Okay, before I actually get into actually, you know, doing a, skepti a skeptical ana ana uh, anal cyst. Yeah, there we go. A skeptical anal cyst of this film. I uh, just want to get, get out of the way that it's going to be a really unpopular opinion of this film. So, you know, and, and from current affairs and, you know, what in the and judging on the ratings... This movie got, I just wanted to put that out there before, you know, people are ready to fucking crucify me and, or whatever. So, because you know how the internet is, you know, a really one track mind going on. So, yeah, uh, the movie I'm going to rate, the movie that I have an unpopular opinion on is um, Wonder Woman 84. Uh I've seen the previous uh, Wonder Woman film. I mean, I enjoyed it. I mean, the story was pretty generic. Uh, but overall, I kind of thought that film was fun. Like, it was a fun action film. It was a little... It was really comic book-esque. And what I mean by that, it can cut both ways. Like, you could really like it. Or, you know, it's just like so... You know, too out there for you like spider-man 2 like or spider-man 1 or the fantastic four with jessica alba like the first one of one movie will like give you those vibes so wherever if that's up your alley or not you know take or leave and that's pretty much what the first film was in a nutshell and i also pretty much always did actually like the fact uh, the more or less the casting choice for uh, wonder woman diana prince herself being gal gadot or Cadet, I, I never actually could get behind her last name. Uh, pretty much, I like the fact they picked her out. Like, I like the whole, you know, foreign uh, 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 aesthetic they chose for a Wonder Woman. I mean, it makes enough sense enough. Like, she's literally a godly human from another, you know, world, like Themyscira. So, it would make sense she seemed foreign to us, like the you know, those who live in this world, in, in this plain existence. And quite frankly, I always liked the fact that she wasn't just strictly just cut up, buff, like, masculine, where it's kind of almost like a turn off. And she wasn't over too feminine either. Like, she was in that fine line between that. Like, you know, like appearance-wise, even demeanor, like, she was, you know, masculine and strong, which she had to be, because she's the Amazonians. They pretty much literally train from the time they slip out the womb to be warriors. But at the same time, I also like the fact that they also didn't abandon the whole really feminine traits of Wonder Woman, which what a lot of people nowadays don't understand is that uh, femininity is not something people see as a weakness. It's simply just... It's a trait. It's it's a, you know, a, a, that makes somebody who they are. I mean, people just kind of see it as a weakness nowadays. But I'm like, no, like, no, like, it's not. And and I like the fact that there's always that fine line with her compared to, like, what they did to fucking She-Hulk in the current comics. They essentially just made her... Kale from Dragon Ball Super or one of them bitches. And they literally just stripped the really feminine side of her and just made her more or less this voided, more or less uh, a husk of who she really is. 
Like, I always thought, like, her, her beauty concept of She-Hulk was always, you know, the, the whole part of her. Like, you know. But but that's besides the point. I'm kind of, like, like derailing from, you know, the act, actual subject of matter of this video. But pretty much that was just me just illustrating more or less why, why I thought Gal Gadot, Gal Gadot, Gal Gadot was a... Look, it's Gal Gadot. I always hear people say Gal Gadot. Some people say Gal Gadot. I say Gal Gadot. Anyway, I, I just feel like I, I just I just wanted to say pretty much I felt like Gal Gadot was a perfect pick for it, for for that the, to represent that fine line between you know strong masculinity and the feminine side. So that was that. Uh. Okay, pretty much the basic synopsis of what I can get of this film is pretty much, well, considering Diana's, uh, you know, has eternal life, she's a goddess, we, uh, she pretty much, you know, keeps her youthful, her youthful appearance up until 1984, opposed to, in the first film, we were set in a, in a, world, in a world War One like setting, so that's like 1914, 1918. So yeah, they pre so pretty much that's where the film starts off, and pretty much literally in that whole gap, uh, 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 Wonder Woman's care Wonder Woman Diana Prince was simply just simping for a guy that she had a crush on from that said time, and she never gets over it, and that's pretty much kind of like one of the essential parts of this film about her character in general, uh, just as well as more or less the beginning part of this film where she's doing like a obstacle course like from the in Themyscira of the upper Amazonians as a child and she kind of like cheated halfway in the obstacle course although it appears that she won she was still like uh, uh, penalized because she didn't win the obstacle course as you know the upper fellow Amazonians did like she didn't do it. She didn't do it by the book, and she was penalized for it. And pretty much that part of the film was supposed to was supposed to illustrate, you know, how modesty is important, you know. Which is kind of actually is one of the most essential things about being a superhero, which I really did like about what they kind of did illustrate with that scene, and. That, that one more or less message, that, that one concept, you know, of course would, you know, come up later in the film. I mean, anyone who sees films, when they bring up, like, one concept about a character, like a proverb, so to speak, or, a, you know, a type of mantra they go by, you know, that, that, that Pacific mantra or philosophy is going to be apparent later on in the film. I mean, that's just, uh, that's, that's just writing one-on-one. I mean... It could be tropey, or it could just be obvious. It, it goes both ways, so to speak. So you kind of know from that it's going to be apparent later, and it does serve kind of integral to the story later on. Uh, pretty much this film has Chris, uh, Chris Pine uh, reprising his role as uh, her love interest, which I'll get into later. And Christian Wig is... The, the 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 lackey villain to the main villain Christian Wig is is Barbara Minerva who becomes a cheetah to Max Lord played by the uh, dude from a uh, Mandalorian who played the Mandalorian uh so yeah there's that like that's just a, like a basic you know thing about the cast like pretty much only four but really just three important characters of this film, uh, which is something I actually want to get into in, in particular. Now, one complaint people didn't like about this film was more or less uh, uh, Wonder Woman not getting over pretty much Chris, uh, Chris Pine dying. And, you know, she never really got over, you know, her losing her love. And <laughs> although I did call her a simp, I'm simply just joking, joking. And they, the, the film uh, illustrates that in a way so that we can understand that because, you know, people simply just don't get over, like, a deceased loved one like that. Like, it's 
It, like that, that shit kind of like will leave like scars on your mind, uh, depending on who you are, and you know, especially someone like how how the how the previous film established Dion, uh, Diana as this more or less really reclusive, like unknowledgeable like uh, uh, character who stepped into another one that that's part of her old, you know monomyth hero's journey, you know concept, her going to a new world and whatnot, and. Having to abide by their principles opposed to her, to her, her, to her own from the first world she came into, and you know she wouldn't get it. She's awkward and she never, you know, actually fell for a man. So the film, and even from a viewer's perspective, noir, we can understand why she, we can understand why she would still hold on to that. Like that's her first love. Like it's kind of like giving a monkey a, a lighter. Like it's. You know, it, it's something unfamiliar to her, but in some way, you know, it's still going to be like a parent. It's still going to show up, and that's the part where they they, they try to re represent, you know, the more sympathy aspect of her. You know, still grieving over a love loved one since seventy years prior. Uh, that's what I mean. At least that's what I saw it as, or, and that's what the film was trying to interpretate. But. Where the side of complaints, where people, where, where I can understand people who, you know, criticize this film was, is like, sometimes that's kind of just life. Uh, Wonder Woman shit happens. Like, you've been fighting battles and shit and Themyscira and fighting for the, for the gods and all that. Like, you pretty much saw your own sisters, uh, metaphorically, you know, fellow Themyscarians and Amazons die in war. I mean... This is just another one you just have to eventually get over, but not completely. Like, but you know, it's like like what I'm trying to say is by now she should be the complaints people have for that concept is that she should be at this point. Diane should be should be prone to things like that, a death of a loved one, or or a cohort of any sort. So, yeah, I can see that side, why people, you know, kind of criticize her character for that, the fact she was still simping over Chris Pine's character. And at the same time, I'm like, you never really forget shit like that. Like, that's your first crush. And, you know, it's new to you. It's something you, you keep, you know, really, you know, close to you. You're really tenacious about it. It's, it's almost hard to actually get over. So, and, and pretty much that, again... That her concept with Chris Pine, that again also becomes really integral towards the end of the of the movie. Uh, Barbara Minerva's character actually is, in my book, actually one of the most interesting characters, like interestingly written characters in this book. I mean, I mean this movie, God, in this movie, uh, but I just felt like they kind of just went, they they kind of. They didn't live up to, to, you know, essentially the Joker to Wonder Woman, Cheetah. Like, she's the, since she's a Cheetah, Barbara Minerva, she is, like, her arch enemy. You think, you know, she at least would be, like, the main villain. But, no, it's Max Lord, played by uh, the Mandalorian. But Barbara Minerva, you, you may think, like, she would, like, play a bigger role instead of a lackey. Or at least, you know, she'll be more apparent as a character, you know, in terms of, you know, when she became a cheetah, like, you'd think that would become more, more, you know, uh, present in this film, but it's just kind of knocked off for a bit. But at the same time, what it, the, 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 the downsides of that character, the wasted potential of that character, or plot potential, as the fourth snake would call it, the wasted plot potential of that character is more or less her, her low expectations, the ones she couldn't uh, fill up, that I kind of feel like the artist kind of really dropped the ball with. But the really best aspects of this character is pretty much how she kind of does serve as like, you know, a, a, a mirror to, to Wonder Woman. She's the, you know, the character that represents the path they would go, you know, if, if they went this route they did. And... But technically, if you already think about it, okay, I'm going to spoilers. People should already know that by now. 
you should already know that technically Wonder Woman, like somewhere mid between this film, she was going down that unrighteous path. As soon as she literally touched the uh, the wishing stone, yeah, that that's important. The wishing stone in this film to bring back uh, Chris Pine's character. She's essentially because Barbara Minerva, she, like again, she she's you know the she represents you know as the character the main character is not supposed to be like like the the darker aspect of the character you know the role they would go if they did this and that instead of this and this the more righteous way and but essentially halfway through the film they illustrate they have Barbara to represent that but Wonder Woman's character technically is was like you know slowly trotting towards that same path as soon as she used that wish granting stone or crystal to bring back Chris Pine, uh, Barbara Minerva represents, you know, a, a, a desire or how, you know, wanting to catch up to someone else will literally just lead you to getting hurt more. Like, she's kind of like Barbara Minerva's character. She's uh, represented as this, like, electro, like you've ever seen uh, Amazing Spider Man 2. Like this, you know, this this uh this social outcast amongst her, you know, more capable and success successful peers. Like she's a she's clumsy, she's kind of a goof. And pretty much she, and she's kinda of like an archaeologist. And pretty much she got and she just like with uh the amazing Spider Man too, she looked up to Wonder Wonder Woman a lot because, you know, Gal Gadot is Admittedly, kind of easy on the eyes for a white girl. And you know all that. <laughs> but on a sense point, Christian Wiig's character, uh, Barbara Minerva, she looked up to Wonder Woman because essentially she grew this type of mindset where she thinks she's almost this impeccable being that can never be toppled anyhow. Like, everything she does is like A++++++. plus 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 plus. Like, she... she uh, Barb Minerva, she developed that type of that type of grandeur for her. It's, it's uh, delusions of grandeur. She and and that's what they're trying to say. Like, no, Wonder Woman ain't perfect. She still grieves. She still, in this case, movie's case, you know, kind of young to the whole superhero thing. Like, no, she's just as false as she's just at fault with everyone else. Well, that's what it's supposed to represent, but at the same time, the fact that Wonder Woman technically already was treading the same path she did, it, it kind of becomes null and void because she represents the thing she's not supposed to be. But already, like halfway through the movie, her old Chris Pine situation pretty much already kind of soiled that concept. Uh, Barbara Minerva pretty much aspires to be like her to get her same attention and recognition. The same attention and, and 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 approval from everyone else, like her beauty, her her strength, you know, her popularity, her her, her notoriety. It's simply just delusions of grandeur, because Diane has uh, has drawbacks just like she does, and so pretty much hitting a more or less a brick wall, a major brick wall in her life. She said, "Fuck it." She more or less got the wish granted stone and wished that she could be just as perfect and, and great as uh, Wonder Woman. And literally in a comedic fashion after it, you know, because some people thought it was bullshit, the wish, the wish granted stone, but it actually existed. In some, in some really yeah, comedic fashion, like she got as tall as Wonder Woman. She got as just as endowed as Wonder Woman. Everyone from their view viewed her as, you know, like really beautiful and opportunities. Um, you know, she even had like the same shoe size and whatnot and all that. So that that pretty much just established that the stone worked and she pretty much and she also got like a few of her powers like super strength. So yeah, there's also that. And pretty much yeah, that's just pretty much would just represent that the Wish Granting Stone existed. And so that's pretty much my piece on uh, 
Barbara's uh, uh, um, Christian Wig, Barbara Minerva, Barbara, Barbara Minerva in this film, because when I actually get to the you know the animation of this video, like of this movie, uh, we 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 we're gonna we have a lot to talk about and her cheetah form when she actually finally does become you know what her old villain shtick is in the film. Uh, you know, that's where, you know, I'm going to be a bit more, you know, rash like everyone else is. Uh, amongst uh, amongst other things, too, in this film I didn't like. Uh, one from being how, you know, they kind of screwed up the character arcs when they essentially made kind of the same character. I mean, yeah, one from represents a more darker angle from her if she went this path instead of that path. But at the same time, they made them the same, as I've said, when he literally kind of almost literally just copied their same, you know, character arcs in this film of how they worked out. Uh, then we go to uh, the Mandalorian, who's Max Lord. And Max Lord is this uh, uh, oil tycoon, which uh, which will also be important. Like, that's the funny thing is about this film. Everything they set up, it becomes important later in the film. But, uh, you know, like, it's going to, like, in some way, it's going to be, like, integral somehow. So, yeah, there, there's just uh, there's just that about it. Uh, yeah, Max Lord is an oil tycoon who's uh, uh, going bankrupt and whatnot. And, again, just like Bar Minerva, he's pushed up against, you know, the wall. So, he's like, fuck it, where's that wish crystal that I read about so I can, you know... Finally, get some uh, get some bread again, you know. Support my son and all that, which also again becomes important uh, towards the end of the film. And pretty much as soon as he tries to receive the stone, pretty much he goes to Barbara Minerva, and he retrieves he retrieves the artifact by simply just more or less getting in her pants. I mean, they cut it up. They, you know, they they jump cut it. Of course, it don't actually won't show it. I mean, a simple Google search would probably give you even it will give you the results that you desire. It's just not in this film, although some of us may wish it to be. But that's besides the point. Pretty much, he gets in, he pretty much gets in her trousers, and he gets the uh, he gets the crystal from her, from her, and instead of just you know wishing for like you know more money or have an infinite. Uh, a resource of oil and whatnot at his disposal. He wished himself to become the Chris, the wish crystal, which is kind of we. Which, in in my book, from how I understand this this movie's uh, story, kind of becomes a plot hole because they established that there's literally one wish per person. When you touch the stone and you grant a wish. So him turning himself into the stone was one wish. And okay, he's able to cast them. But in some way he was still able to You see where you see what I'm getting? It's kinda like a limbo, like, okay, one wish per someone. So wouldn't it mean like someone has to like go to him to have a wish? Instead of him kind of like doing nonchalant later on in the film, when he did that live report, it, it kind of doesn't make any sense because they they later do establish that the stone itself was simply more or less cast on Earth by a trickster goddess that uh, Diane is aware of, and it was put there on purpose to more or less cause confusion and greed amongst people, so eventually all of society can go into disarray. Is uh, that pretty much what they kind of already established there? And pretty much Chris Pine's character, if you even call it a character arc, he simply embodies the the the, the body of another man. Like like as soon as Diana wished him back to life, he's literally there in the next episode. He's literally there in the next scene. But it's not Chris Pine. It's not the original man from uh, the first film. Like, in the flesh, Chris Pine's character 
just took over the body of another man, which again kind of brings up the whole dark aspects of Wonder Woman's character. The fact that, you know, she's supposed to be seen as the main protagonist, and yet she may have faults like everyone else, but how are we, how are we supposed to be led to believe, you know, she represents any type of morality is she simply fine fucking a, a, a guy who has the same face of a loved one true, but not physically the same person? Like, uh, wouldn't that, like, that, that whole phenomenon alone, like, would question her moral ethics and all that, which was established since the first film? Like, you know, the whole purpose of, you know, save, uh, saving man and serving the gods, but she's totally fine with her. She's totally fine having sex with uh, with somebody who's not the same man she loved once who happened to be inhabiting his body. But it's funny. It, well, th that's another thing about the whole plot hole with the stone. If it's wish granting, right, it pretty much could, like, do anything. Then how was... Why wouldn't Chris Pine, like, you know, be sent back to life, like, as his own person, like, as a man, like, as he was before? Why? They they, they kind of, like, breezed over the fact that he literally just is inhabiting someone else's body. Like, for what purpose? Like, are they trying to say he's reborn or resurrected? Like, if she already kind of pretty much wanted him just to be alive again? Like, like it's, that concept, it's never really flushed out. They're just... Supposed to lead, uh, we're supposed, we're just led to believe that this is him back to life, despite he's kind of more like possessing somebody because it's, it's not sugar coated. He's literally just inhabiting someone else's body instead of him physically comes back to life, like like what like the the stone alone, like what what is its established lore, its rules, like. They establish one person touch it, you get one wish. But we got Max Lord here, who's able to become it, despite despite wishing himself to be it. Wouldn't he be just as vulnerable to, to, for people to more or less cast wishes from him instead of him just being able to give it out? I mean, like, like and the whole concept that every time more or less someone makes a wish... And considering he's the inhabitor of the Christmas uh, magical powers, which grant him powers, he in some ways actually like negatively harmed, but the wish is in some way kind of like extend his life or, you know, in some way keep his health up. Like it's just the 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 stone. Like I just feel like it should have been just a like there should have been more rules to it. Like. It's vague, like, in how it does things. It's There's plot holes in it. Like, how is Chris Pine, if if Wonder Woman's wish was to bring him back to life, then why is he simply just in someone else's body? Like, like what was the guarantee behind it? Like, that's the, that's the main problem I got. Well, my, my many problems I have with this film. It's just some things are brought up. They're never really established. The lore is kind of vague. And from what, you know, the pretty much the film throws at you, you're supposed to just accept it and put it together. Despite, you know, how much it doesn't really make sense as soon as you hold it to light. So, yeah, Chris Pryor really doesn't have an arc in this film. And again, he just dies again when more or less Wonder Woman relinquishes his wish, relinquish her wish to, to fight Max Lord and stop him. So pretty much, yeah. He was simply just there to show him, you know, Wonder Woman, you got to look forward. And he essentially just dies again. So, yeah, there goes for his character arc, you know, which is non-existent in this film. Um, so, yeah, that's why I actually think about most of these characters. Like, they're not terribly written. They're, 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 they're not inadequate. They're just fine. But... If it was for this movie's really inconsistent story, like with its lore and, and, and you know, its logic that it set up from the beginning, they might have even been they might have been better. 
I mean, anyone who knows anything about writing, it takes more than just the synopsis and the story for that piece of work, that piece of literature or movie or what may have you be good. Like, you know, the world has to be, we, we have to, you have to make us care about the world they're in. Is it immersive? Is it, does it seem like it could be this type of fantasy world that could exist somehow? Or, you know, the tone also has to be consistent too. Like, when should this be funny? When should you take this seriously? Uh, this the tone like kind of does reflect on what's going on in this world and the characters. You know, you got to think kind of just bigger than, well, I think we've got a good story and a good plot and a good synopsis, so it's great. Despite the characters might be a drag and the, and the, and the world building is uh, limp and the tone really doesn't make all that sense. But the plot, the basic synopsis of it is good, so I'm fine. I'm in the blank. Now, you got to think about all the other obstacles, uh, all the other concepts, my bad, aspects of writing something for it to be good. And this film is literally no exception um, on that concept. Like, you know, the world is pretty much just like ours. It's just in a really regular super super hero world where things kind of just happen um, and whatnot, but other than that, it's just the believability of how this, the believability for lack of better words of how this stone will work in a real world scenario wouldn't go down the way this film depicted. Like, for one, Max Lord would like, you know, rot in jail for what he did despite, you know, giving everyone, giving everyone in the world a wish. So pretty much this is my whole little concept, my, my whole little take on the characters in, in this film. They're not terrible. They could have been written better. But if it wasn't for the inconsistent tone, well, not tone. I'm getting all my concepts mixed up today, but, you know, I, I know what I'm talking about. If it wasn't for the, the inconsistent story and the logic behind the whole crystal kind of just more or less shifting the story in any direction at once, they would have actually been perfect. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, like I said, in terms of like the CJ and the animation, I guess I'll bring up that part. Um, the, the action scenes themselves are fine. They're, they're not like, like, you know, PS2 animation. Like, they're, they're fine and they're choreographed enough and just like in this in the first film you know essentially you know some fight scenes are like slow-mo because you know i guess everyone's still writing the whole 300 matrix you know thing going on i mean i don't know why you always have to make them like most of them slow-mo you could just have a regular drawn out fight so we can actually interpretate what's going on which would be literally my only my only gripe about the fight scenes they're great and they're suspenseful but some of the editing choices that that was used for them kind of really put you out of them or they really make them seem really unconvincing in this film in terms of the whole uh, animation thing i mean yeah the whole choreograph and fighting uh concepts of this film or like even how the fact if you're going back to the whole logic thing uh, Cheetah, for some reason, is just so much better than Wonder Woman in terms of physical, physical strength. Despite literally getting all, most of her physical abilities and traits from only just two days. And somewhere in between the movie, they do illustrate it kind of goes up in her head. Where she literally almost murdered a, a, a hobo. And, you know, again, that also was made to illustrate the path Wonder Woman would go to if she, you know, doesn't learn to let go. And, and again, it doesn't really matter much because we already do see that with Wonder Woman. Her character's kind of pointless on that. It's made to show that, but we kind of already see those present in Wonder Woman. And you know somewhere between it's going to be resolved. So anyway, back to CJ and animation and whatnot about this film. Uh... Yeah, the core, the core, the choreography is fine in this film, but it's just some editing choices they used 
in this film, they really shouldn't have used. And because of it, some of them seem really unconvincing. And quite frankly, you can kind of catch it if you, like, pause or something. Like, yeah, she obviously did a kick from this distance. And literally in the next one, she's, like, a foot further than where she originally was. Like, like it's things like that or... You know, how? why would she do that? Why would she go off her way to do, like, a, uh, do something so, like, use her lasso if, like, a simple clash of her wristbands could suffice? Like, there's just some choices they did in this film that they shouldn't, that could have been resolved, you know, if they took baby steps instead. And some of it was a bit con- uh, unconvincing despite, uh, you know, Gal Gadot in some way actually is like a martial artist in general. So, yeah, there's that. I mean, you literally have that, like, literally on your set. Like, do you know how much she, she, she could add clarity to this somehow? Just with that title, with just with that, you know, title alone that she has? But, you know, I digress. Uh, the CGI, the, the overall... Uh, uh, graphics of this film they're they they suffice uh where it really becomes like noticeable that you're kind of looking at like really obvious cgi was it's, it's at times where you see wonder woman flying and fighting through air like she literally does just look like the time when peter was fighting the time peter was fighting uh harry osborne in the third film you know, nigga, when, when the nigga was like, you know, on his bike and shit, and he just swooped him up. Yeah, that's what, it, that's what, when Wonder Woman is in this film, that's what it kind of looks like. Like, you can obviously tell that's not a real person. Like, you know, it's obviously a CGI. And pretty much a prime fucking target of that was uh, pretty much the time when she was fighting Cheetah. And I'm pretty sure the editors knew that, you know, this wasn't going to fly or work well. Because literally during her fight with uh, Golden Saint, uh, Golden Saint, Wonder Woman. Uh, uh, during her fight with Gold, Golden Saint, Wonder Woman. Most of her fights is shot literally in the dark. Like, yeah, it looks like a, 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 a 3D rendered character is fighting. But you wouldn't know that because it's in the dark. <laughs> but it's still present. And you still know that she's obviously fighting a chimeric, a chimeric, you know, humanoid creature, CGI monstrosity. But you just use the darkness to drown it out. And it's funny because I kept mentioning how I like this film, but the ending really kind of did kind of soil it a bit and that con- that fight alone that concept and the fact that you know this film was all was was obviously trying to patch up their mistakes by making it dark to the point where you can barely uh, make it out it kind of proves that fact even more kind of proves that fact even more about how the ending was kind of shit the film itself being fine I mean it's not something I'll look at religiously, but the ending really did seal the deal that, you know, if I didn't see it again, I'll be fine type of film. Uh, so, yeah, there's that in terms of, you know, presentation and visuals and CGI and whatnot. In some parts, it looks really fucking great. In other parts, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's way too noticeable. So, yeah, there's that. And the choreography, although it sufficed, it also became kind of obvious that, you know, they they kind of fucked up in terms of consistency. It, you know, in terms of moves, moves and choreography and whatnot. Uh, there's not much I can say about music because some of the, the scores on here is literally pulled directly from the original film, even the really action one. That one. I mean, some of it's kind of just almost ambient, like you kind of don't even notice it's there. 
I'm like, you know it's there, but it's so irrelevant. Like, it doesn't even matter. I mean, the sound direction of this film was also pretty adequate. I mean, it wasn't cartoony, like, no Wilhelm screams, at least, nothing like that. Um, so there's on that concept. Uh, although, I did find this movie to be a bit too bright sometimes, like a, like, kind of like the, kind of like the, uh, how, with the Transformers films, you know, the Bayformer shits, how they shit kind of, like, literally looks yellow, but, you know, for this one, it's, like, extremely bright, like, it's kind of hard to look at and shit, so, yeah, but it was there on the light, and, like, it wasn't bad, but the shit was almost kind of blinding. And this has come from someone who's photosensitive, so, yeah. Uh, I guess, like, this is pretty much towards the end of it, where I actually do rear towards more or less things in the film I didn't like, and more specifically the ending of this film, where I pretty much wrap everything up that I have about this film in general. Uh, okay, although how inconsistent like how the, the 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 crystal worked i personally didn't dislike it and if the plot was a bit ironed out like you know if they kind of squashed out a few uh bugs here and there it would have actually been it would have actually worked out better but no in this film as soon as he wishes himself to be the crystal it was itself already a red flag that his film's ending or this film, you know, towards, you know, its runtime really was going to get bad. Okay. Barbara Minerva is so distaste, it's, it's, so, it's so detached from life. Like, this almost, she almost grows this nihilistic and, uh, nihilistic and anarchist uh, attitude from simply, again, only having Wonder Woman's powers for, like, two days. And despite, you know, they kind of established in the film that you can only have one wish, she was able to get another one again from Max Lord when they were on the plane, where she said, where she pretty much said, I want to be rid of my humanity and outlive more of my primal instincts. And you can obviously tell her wishing to be a cheat, her wishing to, you know, become cheetah. It was obviously them was like, uh, how are we able to fit this into the movie somehow? Like, how are we going to tap this on? Like, you know, we know some of our viewers read comics. You know, Barbara Minerva is Cheetah. She turns to Cheetah. So, you know, going to start answering. So, how are we going to fix that little problem? All right, yeah, let's literally just create another plot hole about the crystal where she's able to get a second wish that she was able to grow some Darwistic mentality to be an animal out of the fucking blue like for what reason did she want to actually be an animal it obviously seemed tapped on because they know some of the people who saw this film read the comics or have you know a basic knowledge of uh, DC comics and would start questioning you know Barbara Minerva's absence of not being you know her cheetah so yeah there's that so you're you they they're, the writing in this film they were literally, they were literally, they literally, uh, again, broke their logic behind the whole stone in this film. Literally, just so they can remind people, hey, this is Cheetah, you know, one of women's arch enemy or amongst them. And it obviously seemed tapped on. You can tell. It's kind of almost just like uh, when, when, when Blake from uh, the third Batman movie, the, the Christopher Nolan ones, where he gave his ID to some woman, and she said Robin. Like, you can obviously tell it was tapped on. Like, they simply just do it because they know that people will be answering questions about it. And that's what Barbara Minerva's transform, se uh, second transformation is about. I mean, I don't know why she needed to transform again if she had most of the powers of Wonder Woman prior. But I guess they really did want to establish her sudden mood change to Darwism. I mean, she didn't want to relinquish her wish because that was the whole point why Wonder Woman pretty much, you know, tried to save the day again. Like, 
if people keep wishing for shit, you know, the world be thrown out of whack. And, you know, they all have to be undoed like fucking fairy odd parents. And pretty much she was like, no, nah, I ain't giving this up. I'm, you know, I finally actually mean shit now. Now that I have your powers with this wish. And so they, so it was that concept. And they simply just made her cheetah just, you know, so they could just hammer in that, that, that idea. And again, she's able to fight so much, fight so well, again, for just having Wonder Woman's powers. And in this case, being a cheetah for one day. Uh, I mean, yeah, I know her instincts might give her an edge and, you know, the fact that, you know, all the properties that may come with it. But she was, like, fucking, like, doing backflips and, you know, karate kick, uh, karate kicks and shit as soon as she became a cheetah. So, I guess, you know, being an animal also gives you just natural born martial arts or natural, like, win over the character. Like, like it became so apparent that she even was willing to drown, drown herself. Just to beat Wonder Woman. Or Wonder Woman was going to drown her. If I'm pretty sure. It was no way around. It doesn't matter. They they both. Uh, she was just trying to kill Wonder Woman. Because she didn't want to give up her powers. And since she killed her idol. Someone she literally took powers from. In the first place. She was willing to kill her. Just to save her own. St- just to uh, preserve her status. Which is a good poetic, I guess, but again, you know, this ending and some, and some of these characters that they wrote just really just didn't bring that uh that that whole aspect to home to me when I saw this film. So, you know, instead of you know Max Lord, you know, replenishing his goods and you know just leaving shit far the fuck alone, he decided to give everyone else that opportunity. By videotaping himself, um, by live broadcasting, by live broadcasting himself to the whole world, so they can have that opportunity of having wishes, and literally, he, he and literally it was so abundant the wish giving thing, the wish him giving out wishes and granting wishes, it was becoming so abundant. That literally there was a cyclone in the studio he was in, which I guess was made to illustrate that, you know, it was taking effect, you know, people was getting a wish granted. But again, this is not, this was also an aspect that was never really brought up about the crystal. It just grant wishes. So I guess people would just wish for cyclones. I mean, someone out there was like, you know, I want a tornado. It's like, you know, he started causing global, you know, nature's furies and global effects across the world. And, you know, eventually his son gets tied up to it. So he was like, fuck it, I relinquished my wish so I can save my son. And pretty much, again, he gets no consequences for it, despite literally throwing the whole world in the whack. And the fact that he gave everyone else a wish, is this where it really fucks up the, the, this movie's plot and story? By giving everyone in the world a wish, he's that concept alone literally brung up more answers, brung up more questions, my bad, more questions about this established, but, you know, admittedly failed uh, DC universe to surface. Like, for one, Superman would have obviously wished, you know, for his father to come back to life, or how Manic said, Bruce could have wished his parents would be back to life, or someone would have rule. Someone would have wished to rule the world. Like the him giving the wishes really broke, really broke this story. Uh, really broke this movie story for me. It really did jump the shark, and that's where everything just fell the fuck apart. Because with with his little scheme, pretty much that idea alone, literally brings up a lot of a lot of questions. Of what the characters in the DCEU would have done. Given this opportunity in the 80's. And it's funny that this movie is set where it is. Because it's never. Because 
in the past films, it's never brought up again. I mean, something this turbulent, something this uh, bellicose that Max Lord did, you may think, you know, it'll be like apparent. Like, you know, something like this, like something he did would be apparent, you know, or or brought up in the, in the uh, past films. Uh, but it's not like this. It kind of just breaks kind of some of the consistency in this established universe and this story alone. Uh, so, yeah, there's that. I mean... I'm sorry, the ending of this really fucking doesn't make any sense. Like, it, it, this is where the movie really did. The, the, the boat of this, the, the, the canoe. Yeah, the, 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 the canoe of this movie really did flip over. Uh, like, the fact that they brung up the whole idea of her golden saint armor. You know, being this mystical thing that's almost impervious and whatnot. But just like in the Mulan film, she drops it. Like, she has the whole shit on the wings, the helmet, and everything. But as soon as she, like, fights, uh, she fights Cheetah, she drops the wings. And as soon as she kind of makes herself vulnerable, and pretty much huge chunks of her armor is already knocked off anyway, proving it pointless. And more or less the whole belie- believability of her, uh, of her golden cloth. You know, being, you know, this badass suit of armor is pretty much null and void because Wonder Woman, uh, Diana obviously didn't find it really all that effective either, I guess. Like, yeah, I, I can talk, like, for hours alone about the ending of this film and how it just breaks everything in not only this this movie's story, but also the whole DC Universe logic and, and lore and whatnot. Like, such an opportunity that someone would give you like that. Would you think you'll have, like, grave rep, uh, uh, repercussions to most people that you already have in this world, like Shazam or anything? It, it's just... It, it, it just... <sighs> these aren't... If you... If your audience, if your viewers are asking these questions, yeah, I know y'all heard that. <laughs> if you start asking questions like these, you really need to reevaluate like the writing for most of your work alone. I mean, but overall, I I kind of thought this was adequate, and if it wasn't for the 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 agenda of the main villain, granted, it made enough sense. The uh, if it was for that, because I did like where he was going with it, but it's just the fact that he's dumb enough to give it to everyone else. You know, it's kind of where it it, it 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 fumbles. Like essentially, it was shown that he literally used his wish granting powers to bribe. You know, like local oil, you know, local oil tycoons and, you know, kings in, you know, the Middle East and whatnot to give him stuff he wants to, you know, so he can more or less keep his his uh, crown, so to speak, as an oil tycoon. Like, when they showed those aspects, like, I used it to his advantage. He was kind of sly with it. It was, that was kind of good. And even, like, you know, got some of them on his side to do his bidding. Like, with that concept alone, it was more established than simply him just giving it to everyone else. Like, as soon as, like, you know, all this kind of dies down, like, as soon as you take one step outside of, you know, your little studio, your little comfort zone, you kind of literally just made yourself, like, kind of like a a target, Max, uh, Ma- uh, Max Lord. Like, like, it's things like that. That shouldn't be just question, because it could have been easily avoided on a narrative perspective, but that's just kind of where this film kind of falls flat at it. Like, wouldn't he, like, like they established that he's cunning and sly and smart, but wouldn't he kind of, like, predict when all this kind of, like, dies down eventually, as all, you know, major world atrocities do eventually, 
that, you know, you kind of have, like, so much shit thrown at you. Again, that's just, like, inconsistent character. Like, they establish he's sly and smart and really underhand and has a lot of underhand tactics when he does things. And pretty much him becoming the wish granting crystal pretty much further cemented that. And, and, it, it, and it really, you know, amplified his, uh, his, his uh, benefits, his, his uh, way of doing things to get what he wants. But later, he essentially just gives anyone else the power of the gym simply to extend his life in some way, the wishes, or it kills him. <sighs> Whatever. It, again, it doesn't really make much sense because it's kind of like hand-waved and the movie just expects you to put it together. Um, so yeah, um, if it was for the ending and if the crystal, the whole concept surrounding the wish granting crystal was a bit more consistent, if the characters were a bit more consistent, if, you know, essentially they actually learned how to write an arc for Diana it seems like a better follow-up prior uh, uh, prior from the previous film. This movie actually might even been great. But it's just so many shit to just hold it back. The inconsistencies and plot holes. and Essentially just dumb choices some of these characters do. Um, but yeah, there's that. Overall, I'm giving this an adequate. And quite frankly, if this movie was even more of a mess... It might have gotten obsolete, but no, it gets inadequate. It's like, it's definitely not a movie I would look back look back at. It was definitely good for for like a one trip, in, in my opinion. I mean, I wasn't gaga for it like most people. I mean, I'm not even saying I'm glad I saw it and whatnot, but it's just not something I'm. I I don't see myself going back to anytime soon. I mean. It's definitely a one hit, uh, 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 a hit and, and flick type film to me. Like it was good for the moment, but if it wasn't for these major setbacks, I would have, you know, probably actually in some way enjoyed this film. But that's just not the case, because all this, all the, the, the all this narrative bullshit and, and character upheavals just really keep me from thinking that way. Uh, and I know one thing, again, I'm really apolitical in this channel. Uh, I really didn't like the fact this film was resorting to the whole orange man bad thing going on, despite, you know, Donald Trump not being president anymore. So that really says a lot about this film, Max Lord being uh, Donald Trump, of course. I mean, he even kind of looks like him. Like, his dress suit attire is really similar, his hair, like, this film couldn't be any more on the nose about that allegory, him being Trump. Uh, so yeah, there's that. I'm like, and and and, and with these concept alone, these concepts alone, really it's just going to only further cement how outdated this movie will be in like the next fucking five years. Uh, Trump jokes are literally kind of just so bottom of the barrel at this point. Like or allegories, like it, it's kind of not hard to replicate. Like you can get it by now. Uh, although I personally found like Trump allegories in the past, I kind of find those a bit more actually. Uh, I find those actually more, quite frankly, just better executed because Trump is kind of like a, already a big fucking target. Which doesn't even matter now. If at the time this film came out, he's not even in office anymore. And again, this movie's going to be really dated because of it. Uh, and this whole thing people have with this like whole America trying to steal, you know, the Middle East oil thing going on. Uh, although, despite you know, this movie is is kind of in the 80s, which was actually kind of a big thing at the time, you know. You know, in the 80s, that's when, you know, well, especially for now, like, it almost seemed like this country got, like, 
six buckets of oil now. Like, that's how fucking much it depleted over time. But in the 80s, it uh, oil dropped uh, significantly. And simply, this movie was just replicating, you know, certain truths about that time. I never saw it as, you know, go get their oil propaganda as anyone made it out to be because... Pretty much like the, the, the Gulf War was like around the corner for the 80s, which again, where this movie was set in. And even prior before the actual Gulf War happening, people were pretty much already were kind of insinuating, you know, raiding other countries for oil. It's kind of like how Russia did for Afghanistan. Simply, it's not, it's, there's no, you know, get their oil propaganda in this film. It's simply just reflecting, uh, common idea most people had during that time that was especially you know apparent in the office and the presidency and whatnot so yeah i'm just gonna squash that book right there uh and again just like mulan people say how pro-feminist this movie is uh i hate to say it but uh wonder woman's has wonder woman has always been really pro-feminist I mean, it, it's not like, you know, third wave feminism now, you know, but it kind of always have been. In this film, it has a lot of those things in it, but I don't think it's to the point where it's as, like, annoying or as egregious as, let's say, Captain Marvel or anything. Like, they're there, but they're not as, they're not as uh, uh, blatant as people think it is. And, I mean, she ain't saying nothing like, a woman always saves the world, uh, Chris Pine. Like, it wasn't shit like that. It was, it was, it was definitely blink and you miss it. Because, yeah, that is kind of like a core aspect of Wonder Woman. It's never really a driving force. It's just something she also tends to represent for some people in this film. Uh, for some people. But in this film... I just didn't catch it. I mean, I, I guess I was uh, at the time I shoot when those scenes came on or something because they weren't as egregious or as ostentatious as people make it out in this film. I mean, any feminist, like pro feminist, you know, undertones in this film in my book is literally the least of its problems. I'm just saying that right away off the bat. So yeah, that's pretty much all. I, that's pretty much what I thought about it. I mean, it's just my initial thoughts about it. The character should have been better. There should have been some major facts checks about this story. And although, yeah, there are some political undertones in this film, I don't think that's what it's really all about. It, it's more of a morality type of film, more of a philosophical one, like you know. What it really means to be a hero. This is essentially, this is essentially her, you know, Uncle Ben, so to speak. You know, sometimes, you know, bad shit's gonna happen to you, but you gotta like, you know, keep a stiff upper lip and, you know, fight for a more righteous cause. You know, drawbacks tend to make us, you know, more justified and moral and, and, and morally correct people, and essentially that's why I felt. That was the whole case of Wonder Woman in this film. It, it was more lenient towards more ethical undertones than political, as a lot of people claim this movie does. And again, with Max Lord only being an allegory for Donald Trump, that's just not going to age well. That's not going to age well, which is already a, a big strike for me from this film. Uh... It, it's kind of was just as egregious as that uh, Death Note uh, uh, spinoff one where Donald Trump was in it. Like he, like essentially that that essentially that spinoff manga was essentially just the original writers just banking off his off the success of the the original series, which was only good for like the first fucking season anyway. So yeah, there's all that. Like these Trump allegories are not going to age well. That's all I'm just saying for it. So, yeah, that's just my initial thoughts about it. Uh, you, you guys know the drill. Comment below what y'all feel. Comment if, you know, I feel like I 
goofed or anything, although I'm pretty sure I'm pretty correct about most of the things I was talking about, despite for a few probably slip-ups and, you know, tongue twists. But for the most part, yeah, comment below what y'all thought about the film. Yeah, I think, you know, I should think, you know, this movie should be ass or should be good or, as I initially said, I'm just in the middle with it. Like, you know, comment below what y'all think about it. Like, what do y'all think about it? Would y'all change if y'all would have wrote this? You know, things like that. Uh, like and subscribe, you know. Remind people about Skeptic Autopsy and all that. You know, I keep it really blunt here. I, I ain't gonna, like, murder that subscribe button. Rate that notification bell. I ain't doing that. Like, nah, just, just, just support me, man. I'm a poor black college student. Come on, just, 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 just support me. Knock my fucking mic over. <laughs> yeah, just, just smoke through y'all. You know, like and subscribe. You know, comment below. Get my my name out. Skip the golf tops. You know, help me out, yeah. Help me out. I ain't e begging though. But yeah, give me money. Give me money on my Patreon. Give it to me. PayPal. Uh, PayPal. Give it to me. Uh, 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 uh.